comics, and uh, we've been chatting. We've been chatting about that, and Gerald is very prolific. He spent a lot of time all over the world working. He's presently in London, but he spent time in Hong Kong and, and Basel, Switzerland. He's the author of several books and spends a lot of time thinking about risk and uncertainty and, you know, just behavioral economics. So I'm going to turn it over to him. We're just going to have a good little chat. He's going to throw out some ideas, and then, as you know, we'll have a good little conversation. So, Gerald, thanks for joining okay. us from England. Well, it's not sunny England. That's that's the same. It's not <laughs> not like Toledo. Um, well, firstly, Mark, thank you very much, and hello to everyone. Thank you for um, dropping in, or whatever the correct verb is when you're on one of these systems. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you three sort of what I call provocations, which is um, it's kind of a marketing speak way of just making three opinion points, and then I'll widen them out a bit for about five or ten minutes and then um, I guess throw it open and see if it um, uh, generates questions or um, uh, you know annoys people or, or, or whatever else we, we'll see what happens <laughs> and the three the three things I want to say the first of all is to is to differentiate between risk and uncertainty and I, I think that's actually very important um, I think one of the problems we live is in an age that is is full of people who have got risk management on their business card. Um, and I'm not at all certain that's what they're actually doing. Or if they are doing it, they might be misapplying some of the ideas. The second one, um, in a similar vein, is that um, certainty is a false god. It's, a, it's, a, it's an a, immensely attractive idea. It is, um, it's the crystal meth of decision making. If we only we could have a really certain outcome, what what could be better? And the third one, which I think is the first first two, we could have had this conversation five, ten years ago. But I think one that's come more into focus now is my thoughts that the difference between the um, what one may call the analog world and the digital world. And I think the analog world is in danger of being swamped a bit by the current fascination with digital. And that in, I would go so far as to say I think analog is incredibly important because it's where most creativity comes from. I wouldn't say exclusively, but I think uh, the majority of creativity could be done in an analog environment. The digital world is ruthlessly successful and efficient turning those analog ideas into almost industrial mechanisms that have as we can see have generated the most enormous amount of value and profits but i would still contend that the original idea sits back maybe somewhere in our heads maybe in some form of creativity or artistic in, uh, expression and that doesn't naturally live in the digital world um, that may or may not be contentious for some people. So very briefly, back to the first point, that uh, risk is different from uncertainty. Um, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with the idea of Knightian uncertainty. This is named after an American economist called Frank Knight, who wrote a book, in fact, almost exactly 100 years ago, um, trying to talk about the differences between risk and uncertainty. And the, way, the simple way to illustrate it, mentally, or to draw it through my hands, is to, is to think of a, a simple graph where along the bottom, on one end, we have um, absolute certainty, and on the, on the uh, y-axis, we have information. So if we have 100% information, we have got total certainty about something. And then right the other way down the other end of the axis, uh, x-axis, across the page, we have zero information. We've come all the way down on the scale, and it is zero information. We are ignorant, but we are ignorant in the sense that we don't know, not that we're stupid. And in fact, right down at that zero information, total uncertainty end of things is um, Donald Rumsfeld's great um, mangled unknown unknowns. And I know he sometimes people josh about that. But, um, uh, press conference or what it was quite a number of years ago but what he was actually saying made, made sense so he probably didn't say it in quite the best way 
If we go back to 100% information and total certainty, uh, philosophers here are going to barge in straight away and say, well, nothing's 100% certain. I would agree. But there are some things that are very close to it. Sunrise, sunset, um, tides go in and out. And we have a titanic amount of back data. We've got tide data going back, uh, Lord knows how far, and certainly movements of the moon cycles and even planets and all the rest of it. And it's reasonable to take that very detailed past data, stick it into a model or an ag algorithm or whatever you want to call it, and you can predict with fantastic certainty what the sunset is going to be in San Francisco on the 12th of January, 2,242. You can't be 100% 100 certain because the world might uh, blow up, maybe will blow up the world or, you know, some unexpected event would change. But that would suggest that we have very high levels of information. You have um, the ability to adopt risk models. That you can you can reasonably model things where you've got very good past data. As you kind of slide down to where you get less and less data, you end up in uncertainty. And my conclusion is that because we love certainty, which is my second point, um, we grab at risk management as a way of trying to capture any uncertainty. So we 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 run the risk of of using models where we don't have enough data. And that we start drawing wrong conclusions or maybe filling in the gaps or um, uh, pretending things are better than they really are. The danger with models is, again, they're very seductive because, look, here's the answer. Brilliant. Some guy who's got two or three maths and physics degrees has hooked up this model, poured in all the data, and out comes this fantastic answer. Even if you put a normal distribution around it, it's somehow we mentally feel that we've contained the issue. And I, I think I think that's kind of dangerous. Um, Certainty is not going to go away. I mean, one of the ones that makes me smile, and I see there are a few sort of gray hairs around here, so they'll agree with me, I think. Um, Uncertainty is always been with us. It ain't going away. I always find it really funny when people on the television say, oh, things are really uncertain. Um, well, they always have been, and they always will be. I mean, obviously, that flexes around, but certainty sells. If you can sell a solution or certainty, however snake oil it might be, people will buy it. Um, it's just the way of things. Just to flesh out a little bit this thought about analog and digital, um, I think the most important thing, and it is to do with information that I was talking about earlier, is how, how do we engender creativity and how do we engender innovation? You can't make innovation happen. The government can't stand up and say, right, you will innovate. It just doesn't work that way. It tends to be a, a bottom-up type process. And that is about being curious, maybe, maybe being obtuse or being opposite about things and looking for maybe unusual information. One of the problems in the digital world is that it works on the basis of past data. Past data works on the basis that that will always be the same in the future. So I bought a, a friend um, uh, some books on gardening. Amazon are convinced that I'm a very uh, keen gardener. Um, that is absolutely not true. As far as I'm concerned, it's outdoor housework. Um, so the idea I'm going to be buying lots of gardening books is kind of not true. But they look at their data and, and they build up a picture from what they see of my activity. And they... Uh, they project that forward. Um, that's okay up to a point. But I'm not a tide table. I'm not a sunrise or sunset. I do different things. Also, I want to do different things. So where's the serendipity if I keep being offered the same things because that's what I like to do? You know, you'd, we'd still be eating what we did when we were kids. You know, you go through an age where you, you get to an age where you start trying different foods, which may seem kind of exotic, but aren't really. But if you don't have that serendipity or curiosity about new information, um, you won't try anything new, and I don't think you'll be very creative. 
so that's my 10 minutes i think maybe on the soapbox i don't know if that um generates any thoughts no, absolutely fantastic. And I, I think, too, Gerald, everybody just looking around who's on the call, um, I think everybody here is pro – everybody on the call, I think, is an entrepreneur all doing their own thing and having to provide answers and data to a lot of different folks, both their employees as well as their uh, clients. So I think um, your mention about certainty cells is, <laughs> is, is very interesting. But I, if anybody – does somebody have a question to go? Does somebody want to start off with a question? I'm getting stunned silence. What? Um, well, so I'll just, what, what, yeah, or, or Jim, go ahead. Oh, I was just yeah. So what? I mean, so you're saying that digital is taking over the analog, but what? I mean, what do you see as in the analog world that is better for creativity in a way? I mean, you were mentioning that. I think, I think it's looser. It's looser and not so defined because the digital world, by kind of definition, turns everything into ones and zeros and and okay, it, it goes down to a very granular level of detail, which is really impressive. It's why we like CGI in the movies. It's where you can start looking for patterns. I think you have to be careful with data a little bit. Um, you know, if you torture data enough, it will confess to anything you want to hear. And it'll, con you know, you wait until hear you hear the answer you want. Um, you see that a lot in financial markets with back fitting of data. So I, I think these are opposites. They're not necessarily um, conflicting, but I don't think we should allow digital to swamp our um, abilities to think in a non-digital way. And a, a quick follow-up, I guess. You know, now we're meeting digitally online yeah. instead of analog person to person. Yeah. How do you, do you see that disrupting creativity and, you know, how that's going to affect? Well, it's, it, it's, it, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? I mean, um, uh, you've got the uh, doubtful benefit of me talking to you this afternoon. Um, we likely wouldn't have met. We might have met via articles or in, you know, magazines and things or maybe uh, <laughs> probably that's very industry-based. So certainly this world has widened um, the world I've become uh, experienced on. But I, I still yeah. think there's a, there is a human element with presence that um, is, is missing in the, in the digital world. Um, and that could get worse because um, I haven't seen the very best examples, but there are some stunning examples of AI. And the fact that, you know, will we be able to recognize uh, from the Turing test almost of um, whether I'm a robot or not? Um, that may sound still fanciful, um, but it's not an impossible thought going forward. Um, I think the digital guys are absolutely in the driving seat at the moment. Um, if you want to take a slightly brutal thought, you could say it's the form of digital feudalism because we're all turning into sort of electronic peasants. Because we are, we're talking because of Google. You know, if Google wants to shut me down for some reason, I can't talk to you, or it would be more difficult to talk to you. So um, I think digital's big, it isn't going away, but I don't see it being artistic. I don't see the, ne I don't see the next really clever idea. I mean, in terms of it, own process develops all the time. But in terms of a new disruption, I, I, I don't. But I may be wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if anything, I think it might. I mean, people say they know how to use Zoom and meetings, but they really don't know how to use it effectively. Mm -hmm. So, if anything, this could be helping those people upskill, and it could just help communications across the board. I mean, like you said, the experts are in the driving seat, but hopefully it's upskilling people and maybe it'll be more effective. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree with that. I think um, you, you, you've got to think where, what are we talking about? Pretty much roll uh, the sort of choke point of communication. 
and and, and, you, know, and you know, that may be a political issue going forward, 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 forward. Um, um, rather than this. I've no I've idea. idea. You guys know, know, know well know much about my area, but, but how, on how on earth do you do these guys up? I'm not sure. They're quite pervasive. They're quite pervasive. Possibly. Jeremy, I have a. My name is Jeff Corliss, and I'll just jump in. I, I, it's nice to nice to meet you. And you know, I have a small firm of less than a dozen people, and you know, we met twice a day uh, during the lockdowns digitally, uh, and you know, kept everything together. I was super impressed with my team's ability to do that and harness the technology. And they're all way more tech savvy than I am, um, and. But I will tell you, in the last quarter, when we were extremely busy, we're all back in the office. I just don't see how that human element of interaction and collaboration amongst my team members that get done, th get things done without me gets replaced. And maybe that's where you're suggesting AI has a challenge to overcome. Or is there something you think is on the horizon that could help with that human, intera human interaction element that's missing? <laughs> we don't, we don't have to talk to uh, small rooms and small offices um, unless this pandemic really doesn't go um, and so I think there's such a huge that people, maybe um, wrongly so, will become braver about about meeting up. I mean, I think certainly in the UK there's been quite a quite a fear element. Uh, in terms of, um, we see it mainly in public transport. I um, mean, the London Underground tube system is is very very quiet. Um, you see it on the on the sort of commuter rail lines and all the rest of it. But I don't see why we shouldn't get together. And I I think it's the serendipity element. Um, it's a little bit it's a little bit like why you want to have experts from different industries in a group because. Um, my background in the financial sector, um, we were amazed that models didn't work in 2007, 8, and 9. What do you mean the maths was wrong? That can't be right. But a, a colleague of mine um, was an aeronautical engineer in a previous life, and he said, oh, we had all, and he's kind of popping on a bit, we had all these problems in the 1960s with failures of jet engines and um, similar types of risk problems. And we, we basically spent a lot of time on trying to engineer out failure rates and realize there's more to, to you know, building and flying an aircraft than just purely the algorithm. Um, I think we might, we might be um, seeing a similar thing, and I, this is a bit more political, I guess, where there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a, a sharp divide in the UK, and I suspect in the US, between people who believe all the medical statistics and people who don't. And um, I'm reminded in the financial uh, sector, going back to 08, 09, we had a situation where the banks and finance companies became much more dominated by mathematics. And everybody wanted to price risk with mathematical models um, and then was shocked when the models didn't really predict what was going to happen or was unable to react quickly enough. Um, I think the scientists have got a problem at the moment with medical data. Um, it's starting to go the same way as the economics joke of, you know, you ask six economists and you get seven answers. Um, we And it's a really difficult topic to... We're having real difficulty in the UK in deciding who's actually died from COVID. This is, I know there are one or two UK guys on here, and I'm sure they will agree that there's, this is a big, you know, it's not a row, but it, it's kind of something that's floating around in the background of how many people have actually died from this stuff. And, and that's the data issue. So, you know, so you have all the fancy models in the world, but if, you, if your data isn't replicable, you, you've got a problem. So I don't think interactions going away, but things like you could say this is all enhancing it. The fact we can have this meeting is is enhancing things. Hey, Joe, I was going to ask a question. Or Paul, go ahead. Paul, please uh, go ahead. 
Just going back to your point about um, risk and uncertainty and the, I think you joked that um, there'll always be uncertainty. And certainly I've worked in the financial markets. I know you have for many, many years. And one of the things I just want to press you on is this idea that when you think about, say, something like the media, which is extraordinarily certain about everything, you know, they'll get talking heads up, they'll all be experts, um, but no one ever goes back and checks their previous forecasts about whether they were right or wrong, and normally they're wrong. See the work of Tetlock. Um, I, I, I'm a, one of the guys I follow very closely on, on Twitter who talks about this a lot, Morgan Housel. He, 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 he like rings a bell when this phrase comes out from a media expert about markets quotes, the easy money has been made, because a lot of pundits say that as if it was easy. Well, it's only easy with hindsight bias. So could you just share a few thoughts on on financial markets in the context of the whole talk um, and this idea of risk and uncertainty? Because there are so many experts until they have to put their own money on the table. Well, it's it's a paradise for people who like bluffing, basically, because uh, anybody can make predictions about financial markets. And I think you're right, Paul. The vast majority get forgotten. Um, the iron rule of um, prediction, of course, is to make thousands of them and to only focus on the half a dozen you've got right. That, that's the first rule. The second rule in, in, in finance is never commit to both the price and time. So you can say, oh, the S&P is going up, but for Lord's sake, don't say by December. Or you can say in December, I think things are going to look positive. And both, both those statements, you know, are, com, you know, completely meaningless. And it's, when you actually analyze, and dare one say a lot of the investment bank analysts and all the rest of it, it is just the most enormous uh, tidal wave of nonsense. And, um, but it, we shouldn't forget why, because the mainspring of all of this is, as a client, I want the answer. Tell me what's going to happen next. Why did this happen? So there's tremendous demand for this sort of stuff. Um, and remarkably, the consumers of it, which is, includes ourselves, is we're very non-judgmental. Um, a lot of people have made a lot of careers out of never really saying anything meaningful in, in financial markets. I only wish I'd stuck at it longer. I mean, <laughs> you know, the old joke about as, as stockbrokers that are the... The, 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 the market went up. Oh, it's a great time to buy stocks. It's a bull market. Oh, the market went down. Oh, it's an even better time to buy stocks because they're lower than they were yesterday. I mean, as a stockbroker, you don't want to be you don't want to be a bear. They're always bullish. And the other thing about Wall Street and financial institutions in, in general is that they try to engender short term activity. You've got to do this now. You've got, you know, you need to jump on the phone and buy or sell now. This is what this whole, I mean, this whole bizarre thing of business television, where guys in dealing rooms are watching people from dealing rooms or trading rooms in the States, if you like, talk about trading. It's all madness. And then the only other people who I think regularly, regularly watch that sort of business television are people who really got nothing better to do or are trapped in a hotel room on a sort of foreign business trade. Um, who in their right minds would, well, I mean, there are people who do it, but I can't imagine wanting to tune into Bloomberg TV for any number of hours every day. Um, I'm going to learn absolutely nothing, I think. Dominic. Ah, oh, no, you're mute. Well, your, your microphone is, no. Yes, ah. now I'm off. I was, I was busy pressing the wrong bit on the screen. It was stabbing, I dare say. Ger, it was something that you said a few moments ago about the COVID deaths, because I'm coming at this from the more medical side of things. And people want certainty. People want black and white. People want to know that this is good and this is bad. The fact that knowing COVID deaths, when you talk to doctors, it's very difficult for them to say, if you're 83 and you're a type 1 diabetic and you happen to have contracted COVID-19, it may not have been the thing that killed you outright, but it may be a contributory factor. But does it go down as that? And they don't like overstating it, but they, you know, they certainly feel a need to put it down. You know, and though nobody wants to know about all the comorbidities, the age, the diabetes, what have you, you know, and so 
and then it filters through to the press and they get this and no again no one wants yes or no i mean they they want yes or no they don't want the the detail you know the fineness behind it that the experts bring to it no i mean the only thing i've learned in 2020 is how horrifically difficult medical statistics are um okay. definition of death and all the rest of it is uh, you know a complex issue um but again that doesn't stop people from saying oh well you know, it always goes up on a Tuesday and not on a Thursday and other sort of quite mad sort of uh, phrases. Um, in Europe, it's quite interesting because we have large differences in the uh, rate of cases and the rate of deaths um, in quite similar economies. I can imagine in the States you would expect Nebraska and California to be totally different for obvious reasons. But Germany and France are essentially, you know, pretty con well, contiguous, they've got very similar sort of um, uh, populations and concentration of populations. Um, there will be some health service differences, but I suspect a lot of the differences is how they actually report the deaths and, you know, of what, how that's done. The UK seems to, I don't know, Paul, you might know this, um, it has some sort of 28-day rule, or maybe you know this, Tommy. It's, you have to be there's some rule that you have to have died within 28 days of a test or something. Yeah, you, you can get, get killed in a car crash. But if you have, you've had a COVID positive report in the last 28 days, you've died of COVID. Right. It, that, that is no exaggeration. That is how the stats are being you done at the moment. You have died of COVID. COVID's a contributory factor to your death and you died with COVID. And so people make the assumption that with COVID means of COVID. Yeah. And, and you know, the fact that you died... With COVID, as you say, is it, it was in a, it was in a vehicle collision, you know, um, and you weren't even the driver. Yeah. You know, it's it's just it's crazy. It's this level of detail. I mean, we all probably know a great deal about our own field, so and understand how nuanced and segmented they can be. And then whenever you hear anything you know about being talked about, you sort of clap your hand to your head, going, "Jesus, it's it's not that simple." <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to my opening point about levels of information. So what we're saying is that the level of information is actually relatively low. It's certainly not near the 100% level of, of certainty of information in this area. And so applying very standard statistical risk techniques is probably inappropriate. But this is where I think we're all guilty as an audience, because... I want somebody to tell me what's going on. What's the answer? Give me the answer. Is it safe to get on a train? You know, do I, how many yards or meters I need to be away from somebody? And um, I've heard some people say if they're sneezing, it means they haven't got it. And my God, if somebody sneezed over me on, a, on an underground train, I think I'd be quite concerned. And, and so the, 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 this is where the tension is between the availability of information and what we can do with it versus this absolute desire for certainty. I mean, we, we take it away from finance and, and, um, and the pandemic and just think about in marketing terms. Um, what is one of the greatest words in marketing to have a business with the word that has solution in it? Um, because you, uh, you know, come to me because at Ashley Solutions, that's what we do. We sell you a solution. And that's not necessarily wrong. In some, in some areas that are kind of cyclical and quite predictable, people have problems and you kind of get your car fixed or whatever it may be. There may be a solution. But the more difficult areas, there aren't solutions. Um, at, at the end of this, I will send to Mark a sort of little list of sources of reading and a couple of videos that are worth worth um watching on the net um there there are a few guys i should mention one of whom is called russell akoff who is a management consultant back in the 50s and 60s and he had the idea that there are three types of issue there are messes problems and puzzles a mess is where you can't even dis define you can't get your hands around it there isn't enough information. They're typically, they're typically um, political problems. How should healthcare be run, transport policy, these types of things. In the middle, we have um, problems which are normally 
you can kind of find your way through it. So something like, say, pension planning. Um, there's no right answer, but should you be in bonds? Should you be in equities? Should you just kind of divorce a wife and run away? I mean, there are, there are a number of scenarios you can build out with potential solutions. And then down the other, uh, right at the other end, we've got puzzles, which is what is the cheapest way to fly from Edinburgh to Paris? And if you've got the time and resource, and there are planes these days, you can find out. There is an actual answer. Now, what Russell Acop said is that we have a tendency to look at messes, pretend that they are problems, carve off a bit that we think we can solve as a puzzle, and then announce that we've solved the whole problem. And um, we, you, you see that you see that in the UK tremendously in UK um, transport policy. Whatever the opposite of joined up is, um, is what Britain has for transport. Um, a country where things are genuinely joined up, where I lived for a number of years, is Switzerland. You can literally get on a tram, go to a train station, go down to Lucerne, get on a, a, a ski um, or a, a, a chairlift thing, all on one ticket. You can do it on a day ticket, a season ticket. It all kind of works as an integrated integrated um, system. In the UK, we have um, uh, lots of turf wars. Nobody can agree on anything. As a result, there is no form of national planning of transport. But what happens is politicians are constantly standing up and saying, well, we're making a big announcement that uh, this or that about trains or buses or whatever. But there's no consideration of, 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 the, of the wider problem. Um, and so I, my mantra for you guys today, or for myself, for all of us, is that we have to spend a lot of time trying to find new information rather than just grabbing the first answer that may tick the box. Um, yeah. I wanted to hey, Joe, or, go, Brendan, go ahead, please. I wanted to ask you, 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 you know, you're talking about risk versus uncertainty at, at some point. We know that um, a certain amount of uncertainty is, in fact, a certainty, which is what you were saying. How can you factor that into a, a, a risk management plan that I was hearing from a lot of clients in the advocacy space that they didn't want to do anything in the two weeks before the presidential election because they said they didn't know who was going to be the president? And I said, well, we know it's going to be one of two people. This isn't the biggest mathematical issue in the world here that... So you, you, if you're advocating for lower taxes, you're doing it no matter who wins. Why wouldn't you still working on your strategy rather than paralyzing yourself based on two outcomes? I could make two plans on a given day, right? So Yeah, I, I, I think you make a really good point. And I think, but hey, that's not the single solution. And that's what I want. So even when we're faced with a binary issue, I think we do find it quite difficult to decide. Um, particularly in something like a presidential election or, or in another environment where you've got both sides screaming that the other one is a disaster. So the, 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 the tendency is to say, well, whoa, I'm not at all certain which side I should jump for. I mean, this, this comes up a lot in spy films, doesn't it? There's always that denouement in the spy film where which guy, which guy's the goody, which one's the baddie, who do you shoot? You know, and I think, the tendency is to freeze and do nothing. Also, there's a the human thing that you don't normally get fired if you do nothing. Um, you, you, it sometimes, you know, may make sense to be slow on making a decision. D different if you're a business owner, I think. If you're a business owner, you're kind of forced to make some decisions. But um, also, people don't like going out on a limb. I certainly don't. You want to feel the crowd is with you. Um, you know, uh, everybody else has bought product A. I better buy product A as well. Um, and so I, th I think that that's yet another element. So I'm, I'm not here to, this is really helpful. I'm not here to offer solutions. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's to, it's to engender the idea that we need to try and see these issues in the round and try to in, uh, encourage different points of view. Um, that doesn't sit well in some organizations where you have 
sort of big beasts in the jungle who say, right, you know, we do it this way and, and that's the only way. But I think there is a lot of merit in constantly hunting for information and um, trying to get different views all the time. There's a problem with it. There's a cost. I mean, one of the one of the problems is people don't want to spend spend the time and money on doing that, particularly if they're offered an easy solution. I mean, um, thinking of a really great early example of this from the States, I always think of Skunk Works and Lockheed in the 1940s. Now, what Lockheed did was because there was huge demand to come up with bombers and, and, and fighter aircraft and all the rest of it in a, in a hurry, they, um, they sliced off a bit of their business into a so-called Skunk Works. I think they may have even patented or copyrighted the name, actually. Um, and what they did was they put a bunch of people in a room and say, right, go away and dream up a new plane. Now, that in wartime proved to be very successful. But it's quite difficult to get firms to do that in normal conditions because shareholders are saying, look, you've taken 5% of the workforce off to go and sit in a room and sort of blue sky thinking this is costing money or the rest of it. Sometimes individuals don't want to do it because they think, well, if all we come up with is a square wheel, or nothing at all, it's going to look really bad on my resume. You know, it, I had this really nice middle management job that was, was kind of moving up the scale. Suddenly I went off to this wacko department and my career fell apart. So it's quite, it's, there are techniques for getting around that. Um, 3M, I believe, who, who use this idea a fair bit, um, say to people that they will get some form of pay rise or promotion after their time in the skunk work as an encouragement that you're not going to be labelled as some sort of loser. But it, it's all about kind of hunting around. Um, and, of course, the problem with that approach is the accountants hate it. It doesn't sit nicely in the spreadsheet. It's inefficient. And so, you know, the, the mantra of the 90s and into the noughties of shareholder value, what the hell are these guys doing? You know, they've gone off to dream up some sort of new plane and they come up with some wacko thing that's never going to work and never going to sell. But it's whether we're prepared to spend time and money to try and develop new ideas. And that, that's what I think is analog rather, rather than digital. Hey, Gerald, we're coming up. Uh, we just have a few more minutes left. So I was wondering if um, I was into, I mean, two things. I was wondering if you'd tell us about the bond behind you before we close out. Well, I thought that was a great story. And then, if you want, it's up to you. Um, yeah. But also, I've been struck, you've been saying information, you've been using the word information and not so much data. Um, I think that's powerful because they seem to be different things, information and data. Or maybe I think, context. I think if you've just got a stream of numbers, it's difficult to do anything with them without context. Um, and then you've got to have perfect. reference. And then how do you how do you feel yourself that you have enough data or information to make a decision? Or I think it's very difficult. I think to be honest, I do things because I think they've worked before. I do things because a guy over the road seems to be doing the right thing, um, and then he gets it wrong. So that's clearly his fault and not mine. Um, uh, trying to stay open minded. Of course, this one gets older. One gets less and less open-minded. You know, there's a great old joke of when I was a young man, I disagreed a lot with my father. Now that I'm older, I find he's coming round to my way of thinking. And, um, you know, I think we, we, we do find it hard to be flexible and open. But I think the difference between pure data, and I don't want to get into semantics, but the pure data, difference between pure data and um, information is context, really. And if you can't, if you can't frame it in some way, I think you've got a problem. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna fire some names at you, but I'll put this down on paper. Um, there's a great guy at London Business School, a professor who's just recently retired, called Jules Goddard. Um, he he did a great talk. I'm just gonna check my notes here. Called the Fatal Bias, and it's a nine minute video, which I think is. Um, because I'm a fan, I think it's a genius levels, but it's a brilliant way about thinking about how organizations should work. Um, I mentioned Russell Acoff earlier. Um, 
I don't think he's got um, a lot of work out there that's not very academic, but you can certainly find stuff about him. There's an English author called Paul Ormerod, who's written a fantastic book. In fact, I took it off a bookshelf so you guys could see it. I don't know if this will show the right way around, but it's Why Most Things Fail. And it's, it's called Evolution, Extinction, and Economics. And it's the idea that we can learn a lot from evolutionary theory, which is kind of a gigantic trial and error machine, if you like. And that maybe biology has a lot of errors rather than pure maths. Um, I'll finish with that, but I will tell you the story of the bond. I told this to Mark when we were talking about doing this a few weeks ago. Um, I'm in a little room here, and it's the one wall that doesn't have much on it. It's just got this bond. Um, I'm not living in a prison cell. Don't, don't do that. Um, it's a Chinese bond, and it was issued in 1913. And it was issued um, in the UK, France, Germany, and Russia. We forget that Russian, in the early 1900s, were big exporters of capital. They were lending money to other people. Anyhow, the Chinese government got in a bit of a mess. This is the imperial government. It's around the time of the, you might remember Bertolucci's film of the last emperor, the little lad who was the last emperor of China. Well, there was the evil, I think it um, uh, mother or mother-in-law of some sort, the uh, dowager empress of China, who, um, she was an Imelda Marcos of her days for spending. And they raised this amount of debt, and it was supposed to be to um, help fund the modernization of the Chinese Navy. Um, instead, they spent it on marble in the palaces. So it got off to a good start in that they didn't use the money for what it was uh, used for. But my connection to this is I bought this bond in um, the late 70s. Um, and it was a quoted bond on the London Stock Exchange. And there was a rumor that China was going to repay this debt. And so the bond is for £100. And I bought it for £5, maybe 4 I do recall there was a minimum commission in those days. And the commission was more than the, I paid for the bond. I think I probably paid £4 for the bond and £5 in stockbroker's commission. Anyhow, I was very confident at the tender age of 22, 23, I was going to clean up here and turn it into £100. Uh, that didn't happen, of course. Um, about 10 years later, or a few years later, we started to have this fashion of people buying old share certificates and old um, uh, bonds and all this stuff as sort of collector's items. Um, I've, I've been redecorating the house, and I only stuck this up about a month ago. And I thought I'll just look up online and see, you know, whether it's worth any of my get few well, two and a half thousand dollars. So it is my best ever investment. So I can give you no useful investment advice because I have peaked. I have that I'm never going to be there. So don't ever listen to me about stock advice. Gents, thanks very much for your time today. I will put a, a, a note to mark with links, videos, books you can read, all that stuff. I'll naturally include a couple of my own because it's going to do a bit of self-promotion. But um, thank you for your time today. Joe, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, if you're cool with it, I'll share your email address and um, we'll follow you on the Twitter. And um, yeah, appreciate you, find... you making the time. This was great. Yeah, good. Well, nice to meet you guys. And um, so thanks to the digital world, we did hook up. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. everybody. We'll see you in December. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, Gerald. Good stuff, buddy. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Um, I'll drop you an email tomorrow with some links, and then people.